good morning, Journey Church, and all of you who are joining us from wherever you are. I'm so glad to be with you today. My name is Susie, and I'm one of the pastors here. Well, we are two weeks past Easter, and some of us feel like Lent didn't actually end. We're somewhere, because we're somewhere around seven weeks into this quarantine and having our lives be truly disrupted and fatigue and irritability are settling in big time for some of us. Maybe it's just me. If it's not me and it's you also, give me a shout out, would you, in the comments? (laughs) But it's fitting that we're starting to look in these weeks together. We're looking at the, the weeks after Easter when the disciples' lives were also interrupted and seeing where we might find some shared hope with them. These encounters that we're looking at in scripture where Jesus appears to the disciples and he helps them make sense of what's happening and what's happened since the resurrection and getting them ready for this new way of living that he initiated with the resurrection. This unshakable hope that was gained from the resurrection but is being developed over time. Yesterday, as I was sitting outside, one of my neighbors, Sally, walked by and she was telling me about her daughter's birthday coming up this week. And her daughter has been really sad that she's not going to get to have a normal birthday party like she normally does. So um, Sally was trying to encourage her and she's called a bunch of her friends and they're going to do that whole parade thing that we're seeing a lot of people do for celebrations And um, she told me that she decided to make lemonade for her daughter. So she looks at her daughter and she said, she said, listen, you're never going to have another opportunity like this again. You may never have another birthday in quarantine. This is once in a lifetime. And she said her daughter's eyes got big and her countenance totally changed. What happened was her perspective shifted and she saw what was available to her now and she saw beauty in the limitations and the uniqueness of what she was living in. But here's the thing, she couldn't do it on her own. She needed help. She needed to be comforted and then she needed to be guided to a better way. Well, it's the same with us. And it actually hit me yesterday that this is not just Sally's story, it's all of us. And it's not just us here in the US or even in the West, it's all of us all over the world. Because what this pandemic is doing is it's threading the world together in a shared experience that, that most of us have never experienced before. And it feels like we're in the beginning stages of seeing our culture be reformed and shifted. And I think that's something we should pay attention to. Because also at the same time, there's this natural sense of really craving what was and also this this sense that like, okay, it's not going to be like it was. So how can we step into it being different? We get to choose to look for beauty and meaning in the midst of this chaos. And most of the time, we need help getting there. We need help with our perspective. So today we get to go underneath the story of Jesus beginning to thread the world together through a global movement of people called the church. And it began with a fulfillment of a promised gift that was going to come and help guide them. The gift of the Holy Spirit, not the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because those definitely come later too. But this promised gift was the gift of the actual person of the Holy Spirit. And when this gift and this promise came, It felt like chaos to some people because it was different. It was a new experience. It was was untamable. But in fact, it wasn't chaos. It was order. He was bringing about a new order with new beauty and meaning attached to it. The incarnate risen Christ was going to the Father and the Father was sending the Spirit so that they could dwell among us in a new way, enlivening us, transforming us to further Jesus' redemptive love story into the world. So I want us to open up to Acts 1 and 2. And before I do, before we get into it, I want to give you a little bit of background and then look at the story in the context of what God's done throughout human history so that we might have hope that he's still very much present with us now and in this cultural moment that we find ourselves in. The concept begins of the spirit, or the concept of the spirit begins right away in scripture. The creation account begins with the spirit. In Genesis 1, we see the spirit hovering over the waters and over a formless, empty, dark earth. And we we get hints from this that the spirit is some kind of force. 
not like a Star Wars kind of force, but like the force of God, like, like an actual being, a person, the Trinity, a part of the Trinity. The word spirit, ruach, refers to a number of different things besides spirit. It also refers to breath and wind. But the thing that they all have in common is energy. It's this invisible, powerful force. So like the ruach of the, the wind moves trees and sails and kites. And our breath keeps us alive and helps flood energy through our bodies. It sustains us and it keeps us moving. So when the spirit hovers over a formless, empty, dark earth and breathes life, earth gets transformed. Unformed mass and chaos gets transformed when the, when the spirit breathes over it. And when God takes the dust of the earth and he forms a man and he breathes life into it, life com- it becomes alive and new creation comes about. When our lives, think about your own life and when you encountered Christ for the first time, When our lives come in contact with the Spirit, something gets birthed in us and new creation is formed. The Ruach then begins to transform our lives and breathes energy into us, not only in our form, but also in the ways that we function. But also, this breath, this energy was and continues to be rejected by humans. We choose not to breathe in in the spirit. We choose not to breathe it in. And and even though this ruach has created beauty and meaning, we humans tend to choose to breathe in our own spirit and our own strength. And instead we make attempts to find meaning and beauty and function apart from him and in our own strength and in our own way. And when we do this, it unleashes chaos into the world. Well, in other places of scripture, we see the spirit of God revealing himself in images like fire, like in the burning bush with Moses. We see, we see him empowering people to do specific tasks, like he gave Joseph the ability to interpret dreams. He gave an artist the creative ingenuity to, to design and build a temple. And he gave prophets the ability to see what was happening around them and make sense of it and the wisdom to speak to the people on behalf of God. But when Jesus walked with his disciples, he spoke of a promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit, a continual presence that is the same as the Holy Spirit that always was, but the gift is a new way of being and interacting with God. Just as Jesus was a new way of walking the earth in flesh and bones, he showed us this new way of following God. He also gave us the spirit as a new way to be with God. So let's look and see what happens and what's actually initiated when this gift comes. So we'll open it up to Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I write about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And this is Luke. The author is Luke, who wrote the book of Luke. And is now, this is his like part two of that. So in Luke, it was everything that he, that Jesus began to do and teach. And this is like the sequel that happens afterwards. So uh, until the day, everything that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, when he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so they gathered around him and they asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And at this point, they're wanting to know again, is Jesus going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus begins to open their eyes that the plan is so much bigger than what they can see. The plan is so much bigger than Israel, but it includes Israel. And he goes on to say, It's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. It's not the outcomes are not up to us. But here's what's going to happen. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. 
They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. This is my favorite part. They're looking up into the sky because that's what you do when someone's taken up from you. And these two men dressed in white stood beside them and said, hey, what are you doing standing here looking up at the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. See, Jesus's plan all along was to restore the kingdom of God to the whole world. The promise of the Holy Spirit is that the messianic kingdom, God's presence, his spirit would come and take up residence among his people in a new temple and transform their hearts. <sighs> Gathered and scattered. He started then and he's still doing it now. When this happens, the Spirit of God comes and empowers us, not just where we are, Jerusalem, Judea, the ends of the earth. It happens not just where we are, but everywhere we go and for every task that we have before us. The Spirit is given to empower us in our everyday lives. For my neighbors, it was empowering them to live with joy in quarantine. For many of us right now, it's the Spirit is empowering us or can empower us in the midst of loss and uncertainty. For me, it's been courage. God has been encouraging me through his spirit to help lead this church in a way that, that has never really been done before in, in, in this situation. I mean, for me to be here right now with you like this is hard because I love being with you face to face and I depend on, on connecting with you and seeing you and, and talking with you and, and not at you. But I think, you know, we're making the best of it. But also for me, the Spirit has been empowering me to be present in the, with people when I can't be with them in the body. He's empowering me to be kind and to have self-control and to be patient when parenting. Think about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things that the Spirit empowers us to be. It's a being that he's empowering us, not just a doing. This particular week was really hard for me. I mean, I hit a wall and it felt like everything was hard. But the Spirit helped me endure that. He helped me walk through that. He gave me um, endurance in that. And it didn't change things. Things were still hard, but I was able to walk through them and see and sense his presence with me in it. See, at the end of John 21, where Kevin was last week, Jesus is on the beach with Peter and he, and he has this very loving conversation with Peter and he wants to make sure that Peter knows that he is loved and that he's welcomed and he's invited into joining Jesus to continue this mission. And he reminds Peter of something that he told him a long time ago or before that he would one day build his church and Peter would be the first human leader of that church. And he says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, you know that I love you. And so Jesus gives him those first instructions for building the church. He says, feed my lambs. And then he says, care for and tend my sheep. Feed the babies, the ones that can't feed themselves. Give food and nourishment and health to the people who can't do it for themselves. Take care of my people. Take care of my sheep. Feed my lambs. Tend to my sheep. And then in Acts 1, he tells them to go and be witnesses for me. Tell people about me. Tell them what you've seen with your own eyes and heard me say. Okay, so the word witness stirs up a lot of um, baggage for me. Like what comes to mind immediately are the people who come to the door that I don't want to talk to all the time or the pressure that I felt in the 80s to um, witness to people so that they could be saved. Somebody just threw up in their mouth. But see, what we learn from, from scripture and from the spirit and the context of this story is that Jesus takes ordinary people like Peter and like me and like you, and he transforms our lives by showing love, grace, mercy, healing, and awakening us to his very breath, oxygenating our souls and our hearts and giving us creative energy to go and tell the love story in all different ways because we can't help ourselves. It comes out in the way we talk and the way that we care and the way that we love and the way that we paint and draw and take photographs and make music and work. All of these 
things that we do have the power to tell the love story of Jesus through the Spirit of God. When we experience this kind of healing and transformation, he wants us to give it away to others. He wants us to make his presence known in a way that will feed and nourish people to love and care for people and bear witness and tell people of what Jesus has done for us, how he's welcomed us, how he forgives us, how he sets us free. He guides us. He protects us. He puts our feet up on the rock and he takes all of our brokenness and he makes us whole. He gives us hope. He empowers us with his spirit so that we can go to places we've never been before and do hard things that we never thought we could have courage to do. Tell people who Jesus is and who they are because of Jesus. We can put our preferences aside. We can sacrifice what we have for someone else. We can give more than we think we're capable of because we know that his presence gives us life and energy and breath that's never ending. And that feeding his lambs and tending to his sheep is something that no one can do apart from Jesus, apart from his spirit. Well, the remaining disciples, they go back to Jerusalem, they hunker in in a house and they start praying together because remember, these people are outcasts and they are afraid. They're actually hiding out because these people were a threat to the current order of things. They followed Jesus and they witnessed the spirit of God raising him from the dead. And as the story goes, the religious leaders were desperately trying to keep it all under wraps. Well, it says in Acts 1 that they all joined together constantly in prayer. They were hiding, they were hunkering in, they were praying together, and eventually their number grew from from 11 to 15 to about 120 people gathered and hiding out. And then that's when we get to Acts 2. It's the day of Pentecost, which was the celebration day in the Feast of Weeks where Jews from nations from all over They were of the same religion, but from different countries. So they came from different cultures and they spoke different languages. They showed up in Jerusalem for this pilgrimage, for this feast in celebrating the law being given to Moses, which was actually fulfilled in Christ. And so we see in chapter two, verse one, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like the, like a, the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house they were sitting in. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All of them. The Spirit came and rested on each of them while they were sitting. Verse 5, Now, they were staying in, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? See, God poured out his spirit and gave it to them so that they could have what they needed to tell this story to other people who didn't speak the same language as them. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, they say. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Well, some people, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. So what happens is Peter immediately responds and launches into his first sermon. And he tells them, people, it's nine o'clock in the morning. These people are not drunk. And he tells them, this is what we've been waiting for. This is better and more than you could ever imagine. And he goes on to tell the story of Jesus. And he quotes the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms of the Old Testament that we know now. And he tells them how Jesus is the promised Messiah and how God raised him to life. And it says in verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter tells them to return to God. Look into the face of Jesus and see God. Come to him. He'll forgive you of every way you've lived in your own breath and your own strength that's removed you from his ways. Come and be with him as he is with you. 
and you'll receive the gift of the Spirit too. And you can live into the presence of God with you too. And it's not just for you, it's for your children and your grandchildren and all who are far off. This is the story of Pentecost. It's the story of God not being content to stay away from his people, not being okay with leaving us or forsaking us to the chaos. It's the story of God continuing to be with his people, continuing to hover over creation, bringing life, order, and meaning to unformed masses that are empty and dark. Listen, I know that any talk of the Holy Spirit in this crowd is going to conjure up a variety of feelings, and I don't want to ignore that. So I want to ask you to not run from those feelings, but be present with them and get curious about them and trust that the Spirit might be doing something new with your old experience and your old understanding of the Spirit or your lack thereof, and that He's wanting to meet and be with you wherever you are right now. From Genesis to Revelation and in our own stories, we see that the Spirit shows up and He makes things and people unique and nuanced. He does different things in different times for different reasons. That's how He is. So when we asked you guys in our survey recently, the one that was sent out the last couple weeks, how we can support you, there was a beautifully overwhelming amount of people asking for prayer, for specific prayer. Because when there's a story of chaos like the one we're in now, you can bet that the Spirit of God is breathing into it and drawing us towards Him because that's what He does when He hovers over chaos. It's going to affect people differently in different ways and we're going to experience some hard things still and some beautiful things because the story of Pentecost and everything that begins to unfold after that is that God, through His Spirit, continues to bring life order, meaning, to the brokenness of this world through people like you and I. There's a lot of anxiety right now about how we walk through through this pandemic and come out of it. And last week, Kevin encouraged us to not focus on looking behind us and wanting everything to return to normal. The Spirit can empower us to stay present to what is and look forward with hope and courage to step into whatever new thing will be ordered from this chaos. He will give us what we need to see the meaning, maybe not now, but eventually as he continues to shape us into who he wants us to be. But we still get a choice. We still get to walk. We get to choose to walk in the spirit or walk in the ego and the flesh every day. Our building one day is going, to be, is going to be done soon and we're going to walk in it and everything's going to be new. And we can either choose to like decide we don't want to be there because we don't like the paint color because something about it is different and new. Or we can step into it and see what might happen in there with us. How those doors might be open and how we might go out from those doors and be the church because it's never been about a building. Stephanie and Tim are going to lead us again in another song. And as we sing this next song, I want to encourage you to just ask the Spirit of God to help you see what life, beauty, order, or meaning is He empowering you to live into today? What is He empowering you to live into today? And that may come from a place of feeling lack, disruption, anxiety, but underneath all of that, that's a doorway to something he's empowering you to do. What is it? Is it patience? Is it kindness? Is it gentleness, self-control, love, peace, courage? And pray, pray that you would receive it, pray that you would understand it, that your eyes would be open to it, and pray that he would release you to walk in it. And pray for our local church and our city And the global church, ask God to show us through his spirit how we might walk through this, loving people well, tending to his sheep, feeding people good, nourishing hope and love.